Good day. I will be discussing the differential diagnosis of brachialgia or arm pain. The problem is that the classic radicular symptoms associated with cervical pathology are not always present and that shoulder and neck pathology frequently coexist as in this example with multi-level cervical degenerative changes and severe glenohumeral arthritis. It can become quite difficult to decide which pathology is causing the patient's presenting symptoms. In addition, MRI spine changes are often asymptomatic and in fact inconsequential and misleading. There are many causes of arm pain, but with our subspecialization we think in silos. We need to consider a much wider differential to avoid making an incorrect diagnosis which will lead to incorrect surgery and a poor outcome. As we diagnose what we know and find what we look for, we need to improve on both these fronts. We need to get back to basics, spending more time with the patient rather than the special investigations. We need to take a thorough history to understand what the patient is compla complaining of. Examine both the spine and other systems that may be causing this pain and view with appropriate special investigations. Although this sounds like a junior registrar tutorial, as a community we continue to err with not infrequently patients undergoing cervical surgery for shoulder pathology and vice versa. We need to communicate with the patient to understand what the problem is. The commonest confuser is neck versus shoulder pathology. Orthopedic surgeons are more familiar with shoulder pathology, but neurosurgeons have not been trained in this area. One can identify third shoulder pathology from history where there is a functional loss, generally with reduced elevation and problems with overhead activity. They struggle with internal rotation, such as dressing, clipping a bra, tucking a shirt in, and activities involving abduction and external rotation such as brushing your hair. This may well be in contrast to cervical pathology which may be relieved with elevation such as this young man with acute cervical disc. Shoulder pain may be due to intrinsic local shoulder pathology or radicular pathology from the cervical spine. Generally, when patients complain of pain on pressure such as sleeping on the shoulder, shoulder pathology manifests on the ipsilateral or same side as where they sleep, whereas cervical pathology tends to be contralateral due to the pillow laterally flexing the neck, shutting down the foramen and causing neural symptoms in the opposite side. One needs to look for associated sensory changes which will point one towards cervical pathology. On examination, one can perform the Spurling's test as demonstrated in this photograph. The patient's neck is rotated towards the side of the complaint, extended with some down pressure to uh, recreate the pain experienced down the arm. Glenohumeral pathology may be limited to the shoulder itself but can also radiate down towards the elbow and every patient presenting with cervical pathology sh should at least have a shoulder screen. This can be done in seconds by asking the patient to place both hands behind the head and thumbs to the scapula looking for pain and reduced range of motion. Rotator cuff pathology can be confirmed by palpation with tenderness anterior in the shoulder. Abduction may be limited, the patient may well have a painful arc of elevation and on supraspinatus testing there may be pain and or weakness. This is simply done by asking the patient to place both hands out at 45 degrees, rotating the thumb to the floor and elevating the arm against the examiner's resistance. Should there be pain or weakness, supraspinatus tear may be present. This may well respond to a subacromial injection of local anesthesia. The x-ray on the right 
confirms the superior migration of the humeral head due to the loss of their cuff's normal downward function. There may be reduced subacromial space. And in the x-ray above, you can see the so-called eyebrow sign, which is a sclerosis underneath the chromion, indicating early impingement. This patient presented with um, initially lumbar pathology, then cervical, undergoing an ACDF, when all along the predominant symptoms for the patient were calcification in the rotator cuff, which can be an extremely painful pathology. Other causes of classic shoulder pain can be due to chromoclavicular joint arthritis, sternoclavicular joint arthritis, frozen shoulder, bicipital tendinosis, labral lesions such as slap lesions. Elbow pain may be due to local pathologies involving the muscle origins. Laterally, the extensor muscle wad may present with pain in so-called tennis elbow. This is easily excluded with Mill's test where one does resisted extension of the wrist which results in severe pain in the extensive ward in tennis elbow. Similar tests can be done with downward pressure on the middle finger. The flexor muscle origin may also create, cause pain and is termed golfer's elbow. This can also be done with resisted flexion of the hand to provoke the pain. More distally around the lateral border of the wrist, the abductor pollicis can become inflamed in the first compartment of the extensor retinaculum, causing pain in the thumb area, which could be confused again with C6 radiculopathy. This can easily be excluded by flexing the thumb into the palm of the hand and flexing the patient, active, and letting the patient actively flex in a, a medial direction, causing severe pain over this area. Other causes of wrist pain can be base of thumb arthritis, which can be demonstrated with the grinding test of the thumb, carpal arthritis itself. Pain can also be referred from the uh, visceral organs. This 56-year-old man was referred to me some years ago with a history of insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. He had thoracic pain radiating to both shoulders. He had a normal stress ECG performed by his family practitioner, an MRI requested which identified a T5-6 disc and he was referred to me for transthoracic surgery. However, on taking a history, I was concerned about his periods of hyperventilation, anxiety and sweating, for which he'd been treated with benzodiazepines and anti-inflammatories. I sent him off to another cardiologist who performed an angiogram, revealed major heart disease and underwent urgent surgery with total resolution of his symptoms. The diaphragm may also refer to the shoulder tip, and this may do, be due from base of lung pathology such as atelectasis or subphrenic abscesses. Arm pain may be due to brachial plexus pathology. In patients who do not have a clear single nerve root involved, this should be considered. It may be due to thoracic outlet syndrome, which is a rather vague pathology. The brachial plexus coming over the first rib or may be affected by an additional cervical rib between the scalenus muscles. This patient presented with right arm pain. He was noted to have a ptosis of the right eye. And they've got a carpal tunnel release by another surgeon for his arm pain with no resolution of symptoms. The cervical x-ray demonstrated age-appropriate degenerative changes. However, on the AP, one can see the apical lung uh, involvement with destruction of the proximal ribs, indicative of a pancreas tumor. This was affecting his brachial plexus and causing the Horner syndrome. In addition, 
Viral conditions such as Parsonage Turner syndrome can also heal a brachial plexus neuritis with a variety of pain and motor fallout. The ulnar nerve may be affected around the elbow in the cubital tunnel syndrome. This may present with ulnar distribution sensory changes, some weakness in the ulnar innervated muscles. This can be identified by tapping around the elbow, especially with the elbow flexed up at about 120 degrees. It, the ulnar nerve in it, uh, may also be trapped in the Guillain's canal at the wrist, where there's the paradox of the claw due to the differential action, action of the intrinsics and the long flexors. In this case, the dorsal ulnar sensation is intact because the nerve root comes out before Guillain's canal. The median nerve may be obstructed or compressed more proximally to the carpal tunnel syndrome anywhere from the medial supracondylar process of the humerus, the ligamentous struthers, the lysertius fibrosis of the bicipital tendon, and the origin of the pronototeres and the FDS muscles. This will manifest with median nerve paresthesia and weakness. One can confirm this with more proximal tap tests causing this paresthesia and a variety of provocative, uh, provocative mechanisms to try and identify this. Resistant supination and elbow flexion beyond 120 may indicate that the nerve is irritated under the Lysertius fibrosis, whereas entrapment between the heads of the pronator teres may be elicited by resistant forearm pronation with the elbow slowly extended from a full flexed to extended position. The radial nerve syndrome is uncommon and generally presents without motor and sensory changes. Occasionally there may be some sensory radial disturbance, but generally the patients complain of a dull, aching, burning pain over the lateral aspect of the elbow in the region of the extensor supinator muscle mass. They, they usually worse with repetitive elbow motion or wrist extension and forearm pro and supination and relieved by rest. This can easily be confused with tennis elbow in addition. The anterior interosseous syndrome is due to irritation of the anterior interosseous nerve. There may be a dull ache typically no sensory component and will manifest with muscular weakness of the FDP. Here you can see the O sign where the patient is unable to put the tip of his index and thumb finger together to form the O, but rather the picture on the left hand side. The posterior interosseous syndrome may result in pain and weakness with inability to extend the digits. It may be incomplete as demonstrated in this picture. Likewise, the suprascapular nerve can be entrapped in the glenoid notch of the scapula and healed post shoulder pain, sometimes with atrophy of the infraspinatus and supraspinatus muscles. This can be difficult to distinguish between the pain associated with the C7 radiculopathy. Unfortunately, although many people uh, suggest nerve conduction studies to assist in the diagnosis of these conditions, they are often inconclusive. Many times one is sitting with deciding whether the patient has a carpal tunnel syndrome or C5-6 disc, they may have both, and the nerve conduction studies really fail to make a difference between the two. They are often inconclusive, and one needs to go through the whole process of history, examination, and special investigations, not simply using one of them. So the take-home message is broaden your differential as we diagnose what you know and find what we look for.